Okay. Um, so we are coming to the final session, and I uh, have the pleasure to announce our next two speakers. Well, first our first speaker. <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't have to introduce Anton Seilinger. I'm hmm? tempted to say you know him from TV and radio anyway. Um, B BBC was just uh, filming today. Um, but uh, Anton is here in a double role. Um, of course, uh, he's one of the founding fathers of, of our group anyway, um, but also one of the founding fathers of Kokus, one of the ten, um, um, ten professors that, that founded Kokus. And in that role he's here, and of course is a long-term friend of Reinhold Bertelmann. And um, so I hand over the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. It's actually a great pleasure to be here, and this time I really mean it. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here and give this talk uh, for my old friend Reinhold. We know each other for a very long time, and it started long before I came to to, to Vienna. Uh, he actually came with the suggestion to hold together a seminar here, which we did for a couple of years, where we worked through many of the fundamental issues of quantum mechanics with the students. And uh, this was big fun. And I, I am, oops, what is this? So it, for some reason, it tells me that it could not it could not check the, 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 it doesn't have the right dictionary for Polish, but I don't know why it needs that. <laughs> you know, it's very strange. <laughs> anyway, so I, I this, so, uh, so we, we uh, this was actually very, very interesting, and it also was good for the students, even before I came here, to get some of the idea of the things which we, which we, which we uh, uh, have been doing. And I knew the name Reinhold for some time uh, from a picture which I'll show you immediately, but I didn't know that this is the same Bertelmann. <laughs> it took a while until I realized that. Anyway, so I chose today a title, uh, 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 the title Experiments and the Foundations of Quantum Physics because it ties to our discussions at seminars and so on and so on. And what I want to do is I want to uh, talk a little bit about the recent experiments, which mainly we did, because I know them best. And I also want to tie them into, the, into, into, uh, what, uh, into experiments by others here in Vienna, some of the Viennese tradition I want to mention. And, uh, and also I want to speculate a little bit of wh where we should go in the future. So this is limited. It, I cannot cover everything which has to be done on the the foundations of quantum mechanics. As, as uh, all those who know me, what you see here is uh, an instrument on the Canary Island of Tenerife, where we do experiments using these telescopes. Uh, some of the people are here, and it's really, uh, it's really fun to do experiments on the Canary Islands, not for the reasons which you think, but it's a fantastic experimental environment. So. This is the picture I refer to, a very famous picture done by John Bell. Uh, it, it, it must have been one of the very first confer conferences on, on uh, Bell's inequality and the experimental situation and so on at the Fondation Hugo, which is a foundation uh, uh, which was dedicated by Mr. Hugo, who was very rich, to the Collège de France, and they organize uh, occasionally conferences there. And uh, the, it, there's an art article by John Bell which is called Bertelmann Socks and the Nature of Physical Reality. Uh, in order to, uh, 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 John Bell wrote this uh, because uh, uh, he wanted to explain that the reality in quantum mechanics is not like Bertelmann Socks. When you see Bertelmann turning around the corner, like it shows here in the picture, and you see that one of his socks is pink, you definitely know that the other sock will not be pink. And you know this because of two reasons. Firstly, you know because this is a, way, uh, this is a conjecture based on earlier observation of Bertelmann, so it's an experimental observation, it's a knowledge. He also might tell you that he usually wears, wears uh, socks of different colors. And these socks have different colors, and this is now important because he puts on in the morning socks with different colors. 
So these are elements of reality. They exist. They are there in their colors, uh, independent of whether you care to look at it or not. And as Bell goes on in the article, if these were quantum socks, the assumption that they had their colors before you look at them would be wrong. And I recommend to read the art, everyone to read, uh, to read the article. It's written for non-physicists, but it's also for physicists interesting to go through the argument, because it's a very nice and beautiful argument. So let me jump into the topic of my talk. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, John, uh, John Bell already, with, with whom uh, 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 Reinhold shared an office for, uh, for some time in, 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 uh, in uh, Geneva at CERN. And I'm not the right person to talk about the physics which you did there, because this is not my field. Uh, but, uh, but still, uh, uh, I want to t talk a little bit about the story of uh, uh, this kind of, of, of uh, uh, physics for which John Bell became famous. It goes back to this uh, paper in 1935 uh, by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? Before we go into what the paper means, I want to uh, give you two bibliographical pieces of information. Firstly, this paper was never seen by a referee. It was accepted by Physical Review right away. In the old days, editors of journals uh, 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 accepted uh, usually many papers, just uh, based on their own judgment. And uh, as soon as, as, as Einstein, uh, as soon as Physical Review sent Einstein's papers to referees, he did not send them any paper again. Uh, and this is not as funny as it sounds, because he had a serious reason. The serious reason was that he said that, that the discussion between referees and the author is a scientific discussion, and all scientific debate has to be out in the public. And this is actually a, a reasonable argument. It would be difficult to do this today, but anyway, th this was his, his, uh, his uh, opinion. Now, if we, if we look at the, ah, we have one screen, very good, so it's simple. I don't have to use two pointers. Uh, what the point of this paper was simply that there can be situations where you have quantum systems which are, uh, uh, which are connected, the modern language is entangled, in such a way that they have a joint quantum state, but the state does not factor in the individuals. The individuals do not have a well-defined quantum state. And therefore, if you make a measurement on one system, the other one, no matter how far away, will change its quantum state instantly, at least for the first measurement, if that is a perfect measurement. Now, uh, I want to, here's my second piece of bibliographical information, which is quite interesting. The number of quotations, citations of the EPR paper as a function of year, according to the science citation index. Here's 1935, when the paper was, was published. There are a few quotations and then nothing. So, you know, today uh, we charge, uh, in my eyes, too much uh, 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 the scientific performance of people uh, based on their citation record and so on. From that viewpoint, this paper was completely unimportant and it would not have given Einstein a permanent position and things like that. You know, thankfully, he had it already, <laughs> so he didn't need it, you know. Uh, and then, then two interesting developments happened. In the 1950s, a few quotations, they, uh, the discussion of the foundations of quantum mechanics started again, and then it really took off. Because here, John Bell published his famous theorem. Uh, it, it took off, there were experiments and further theoretical papers, and then it really exploded around 2000. What happened around 2000? That around 2000, something happened which was not expected by anyone early in the field, namely that it turned out that this, this entanglement, this connectedness uh, uh, proposed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen uh, turned out to be useful in a new field which is called quantum information, quantum information science, where you have quantum computers, quantum cryptography, and other things. And this is actually uh, something which happened often in the, in the history of science that uh, some of the most interesting, most important technological breakthroughs, and I believe that we will have quantum information technology someday, 
uh, uh, happened because out of curiosity, because people investigated things uh, just because they wanted to know how nature is. And I always tell my polit politician friends, I tell them, if you want us to do something useful, you should not ask us to do something useful. Because the long-range things you cannot judge. You cannot judge what will be important or not. Now, here is, uh, in a nutshell, for those of you who don't know it yet, here is Bell's inequality. John Bell in 1964-1965 uh, investigated this entanglement situation for, for two-state systems, earlier suggested by, by David Bohm. Here is the quintessential experimental setup of the way which we use it, how we use it in, in, in our laboratory routinely. You have a source which puts out uh, two uh, uh, photons, uh, which can be described in this polarization state. They are both either horizontally polarized or both either, either vertically polarized. The important, you do polarization measurements on the two photons. You find out that, uh, that all, this is operational now, you find out that if you measure polarization horizontal vertical, either both are horizontally or both are vertically polarized. From that, uh, uh, you write down this quantum state, it's a superposition of both horizontal, both vertical. And the important point, point now being is that this is a superposition and not a statistical mixture. Simply meaning that you, it, that you cannot assume that half of the photons are polarized this way, half are that way. Rather, no, none of the photons carries any inf polarization until they are measured. If you measure one, it assumes randomly, completely randomly, either this or that, for example, the first photon, and then the second one, no matter how far away, it is instantly projected into the corresponding state. Now, following the reasoning of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, uh, Bell uh, uh, tried to interpret these correlations on, uh, on the basis of what is called local realism, which is the conjunction of the viewpoint of locality, meaning that there cannot be any influences propagating faster than the speed of light, and realism, meaning that the experimental results reflect somehow, I'm cautious here, reflect somehow uh, features of the world which exist prior to and independent of information. The conjunction of these two assumptions uh, tells you that a certain sum of expectation values of the correlations has to be smaller than two, and quantum mechanics uh, says that it can be larger than that. In a nutshell, it means that correlations between quantum systems can be, can be stronger than the local realistic model tells you. Now, it turns out that this started, it was an interesting re reaction when Bell came out with this. The reaction of a large fraction of the community was, okay, fine, we know that quantum mechanics works, so this is that. But people didn't realize that no experiment existed uh, to actually prove the inequalities and the whole a whole uh, history of, 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 of experiments started uh, uh, beginning with Friedman Clausen in 92, where they look at uh, correlations of, uh, of photons, uh, polarization correlations, and there's a long, long history. I just quote a few of the, of the, of the, of the papers. The, uh, the question I want to ask now is what remains to be done? This was a sub, subtitle. I just want to mention uh, three loopholes in these experiments. One is the communication loophole, which is, uh, th these loopholes are, 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 are loopholes of the, of the experiments, or maybe even some of the, some are very fundamental, uh, which are such that the local realist could still save his neck. Uh, one is the communication loophole, which, uh, which is the assumption that, uh, in the, in, the, in the old experiments, like this one, you have just a, a source and you have two polarizers which are sitting and measuring certain angle. There is lots of time how some way of communication, maybe not known to us which way it is, some way of communication establishes the, the, the quantum correlations. So locality would not hold here because you have ample time to communicate and you can get the, the quantum results. The way to to, to break this is to, to trick nature, to change the polarization. You want to measure the polarizer orientation in the last instant. So nature thinks that you are measuring along this way, but you really measure along this way, okay? Uh, 
there have been experiments, the first experiment by the ASPE group in 92 with periodic switching, and we did something in 98 with very fast random, uh, uh, random switching of the polarizers, which closed this loophole. The other loophole is the fair sampling loophole, as how it, it is called, and that is the following. Uh, if you, as long as you detect a subset of the two uh, particles only, you can always find a model, uh, 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 a local realistic model, which still explains the data. Uh, it has been shown uh, uh, by various people that you have to uh, detect at least two thirds of the particles such that uh, such an explanation is not possible anymore. Okay, a local realistic explanation. This was closed, but, but uh, it was closed by, uh, by the Vineland group for, for atoms or ions sitting close to each other in a cavity. I just heard that it was also uh, closed by another uh, group. I was told recently with uh, superconducting entangled qubits, but, uh, but always on distances which are small, such that, you, that the communication loophole and so on is wide open. And there's a third loophole, which has is not been discussed very often, but it has been mentioned already by John Bell in his early, in his early papers. And that is, uh, it is crucial for, the, for his whole reasoning to arrive at the inequality to go through, uh, uh, that, the, that the choice of the settings of the analyzers is free, is not influenced by a common cause in the past. Now, this is a very difficult loophole to close in general, because the common cause could be anywhere in the past. But there are subsets of that assumption one can test. And specifically, one can uh, test the assumption that this common cause might be created together with the particles at the source. And to exclude that, you simply have to put your, 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 your decision, what you measure, your random number generators, at a space-like separated uh, distance. This is an experiment which we recently did. It was actually done on Tenerife, but by our group. Just uh, uh, to show you the logic of the experiment again, we, we have on the island of La, La Palma, we have a source which produces uh, uh, entangled pairs of photons. We send, this is a space-time diagram of the situation. Uh, we send one photon, here we create a pair, and in the, in the source, we assume they are in the, in the, in the, at the same time together with the pairs, there are some local variables called lambda created which influence uh, the, not only the measurement results, but maybe also the polarizer settings in, in, in the spirit of, of John Bell's <laughs> argument. Then the two photons propagate. One propagates uh, to Tenerife. This should actually say Tenerife here. This should be moved over. Uh, to Tenerife, and it's measured here at B. It, it propagates a little bit inside the light cone because the propagation in air is a little bit slower than the, than the speed of light. Uh, the other photon is kept locally. We don't have, this was an important discovery we made when discussing the experiment, you don't have to send both photons far away. It's enough that you send one photon. The other photon is kept locally in the glass fiber. Here's the future light cone of that measurement event. Uh, uh, and then what you do is you, you have your random number generators which decide which polarization is measured. Is here at little b, which is at the same location in Don Tenerife as the measurement, but just much earlier than, the, than any signal could have arrived. And uh, for, for La Palma, you just generate your random numbers at the, nearly the same time, but at a distant location such that no, no communication is possible. So we have three events now which are mutually space-like separated, so no communication is possible between the source event and the two detectors. Likewise, in reverse, no communication is possible from, the, from these events, deciding the random numbers, to the source. So we exclude two ways of communication here, and include the old one, namely the communication between the two, between the two polarizer settings. Uh, here's the setup. On, uh, uh, here's the, 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 the source on, on La Palma, produces two entangled photons. I don't want to go into details here. One photon is kept locally in a long glass fiber, and then its polarization is measured on La Palma. The other photon is sent over a free space link to the OGS, to the optical ground station, the telescope you saw in the beginning on Tenerife. 
when uh, uh, the, the, uh, the polarization is me which is measured is decided by a, a fast random number generator. One is shown here, the other one is not shown. Fast random number generator uh, using just the behavior of photons at the beam splitter. This is uh, as random as you can have it. Uh, but this uh, number is sent over to to uh, to, uh, uh, ten, uh, to 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 La Palma, and then it sets the AOM, the electrofield modulator, which which chooses the polarization direction measured. Uh, similar situation is over on on the island on, of Tenerife, and lo and here's again the again the experimental results here. Uh, on 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 uh, the, the situation on La Palma, uh, the source, uh, the one photon sent over to Tenerife, and here's the random number generator one kilometer away, and here's the situation on Tenerife how it looks like with the photon coming over from La Palma here to to, to Tenerife. So this is the geographical situation, and I I, as I told you, it's very interesting to do experiments in this environment. It, 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 it creates a nearly an atmosphere ne nearly like in a monastery when you have five or six people working on, on each island, working all night and so on. And I would be happy to welcome you someday when we do the next experiment <laughs> to visit us there. That would actually be big fun. And maybe we can do the experiment with the socks also on Tenerife. So here, so, so lo and behold, we confirm quantum mechanics. Here are the people on the, on the experiment and the paper was just Accepted by the by the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of uh, of Science of the of the U.S. Now, what remains to be done? What remains to be done is clearly a fully loophole-free experiment because our, in our case the detection loophole is still wide open. There are various ideas how one could do it. Uh, there are about three or four groups now discussing this kind of thing. We are most interested in doing the experiment with photons. And there are uh, two or uh, three aspects looking into the future. One is we need detectors which have a high quantum efficiency. And these detectors exist. These are called transition edge superconducting detectors. These are superconductors uh, operated at the transition edge, actually in the transition edge, which is not, as you learn in theory, a steep transition, but it is a continuous transition of a superconductor. And so, when a when a photon is absorbed in the super in the in the in the, in the uh, uh, superconducting detector, here's a picture. Then the, uh, the 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 superconductor becomes a little more normal conducting, and you see an increase in resistivity. And uh, this is a polarimetric measure. So, uh, and uh, there all you have to do is you have to make sure that the photon gets in there. And once it is in there, you detect it. And from all it is known, the efficiency can be uh, as high as you want, certainly above 90%. Uh, so, once, so, so such an experiment is possible with the superconducting detectors and separation of a few hundred meters, which you need for the fast, uh, for the fast switching. Uh, so if that experiment is done, what remains to be done? And there are some interesting fundamental issues, which I'm sure Reinhold will love to discuss with us. There are some interesting fundamental issues, and these concern the question: What can, what, what could be, what are really valid uh, independent sources of randomness? In the experiments, we use quantum random number generators to test quantum mechanics, which some people say might be a logical loophole. You might want to use something different. Uh, one suggestion, which has been made in the very early days of quantum mechanics, is to have human observers to make the decisions. So you will have people sitting there and making the decision which polarization to be measured. Now, there's a whole can of worms. I know our, our biology friends today tell us that there is no free will and so on and so on, an argument which I don't buy, but I don't know, maybe they are correct. But independent of this, from a practical point of view, it takes us humans about a tenth of a second to make a decision. So that means that the apparata have to be are separated on the order of maybe 100,000 kilometers or more. Now, this is not an easy experiment, but not completely unfeasible. Uh, there's another, another possibility, and that is, it has, has already been discussed. I know that it has been discussed already in, in 1975 at this first, first dis 
conference in Eriche where John Bell was, that one could use, people ask themselves what would be the most independent sources of information in the universe. And they suggested to use the light from quasars. From quasars, quasars are, are, are quasi-stellar objects, they are objects which, which existed in the very, very early days of the universe and they are uh, a distance is away of, of uh, 12, 13 billion uh, uh, light years. So if you look at, at two quasars at opposite locations on the sky, this is as independent as probably any information can be. And uh, for example, in the experiment, we would use some fluctuations in the quasar light. And it turns out, by sheer luck, it turns out that both on La Palma and on, La, on Tenerife, there are instruments close by to our experiments which have been used in extensive quasar searches in the 1980s. <laughs> so we are thinking of reviving some of these experiments. Some of these telescopes don't work anymore. We are thinking of revising some of these telescopes for our experiment. But whatever the experiments will be fun and they are, fun, they are, they are nice. Another kind of experiments which we discussed in the se seminar a couple of times, and that's the reason I included it here, was the Wheeler's Delayed Choice Experiment. It's a beautiful Gedanken experiment proposed by John Archibald Wheeler. He says, uh, uh, you know, when I have a particle going through, in, through the, say, the two-slit experiment or through in, going, going through an interferometer, uh, when does the uh, particle decide whether it behaves as a wave or as a, as a massive particle? Uh, and, and Wheeler suggested that actually the particle doesn't decide that. <laughs> it is you as the experimentalist who decides that. Uh, he suggested the following. Uh, here's the first the Gedanken experiment. He said, okay, I have an interferometer here where I have a half-silvered mirror and a wave packet which is split into two partial waves which propagate on the interferometer along two separate paths. These are 100% reflecting mirrors. And then he says, here I can choose whether, whether the, the photon, the individual photon, he uses that language, behaved as a particle or as a wave, depending on what I put in here. I can put here either a mirror, a half-silvered mirror, which would, which would then reflect some of this wave into this detector, some of this into that detector, and some of this would go through, some of that would be reflected. It turns out if you do it right, you can have the intensity here be zero, which means that each photon which comes arrives in this detector, never in this. This, by the way, is, a, is the strongest confirmation that the quantum state describes individual systems. Because how would the individual photon know uh, if it were not in this quantum state, which is a superposition of both possibilities, that it has not to go here? Uh, by the way, this was actually a uh, one of the wrong conjectures of, of, of Einstein, but that's a different story. Now, on the other hand, if we don't put our, our, our mirror in, uh, then uh, and we leave our detectors there. This detector would tell us that the photon came on this route. This detector would tell us that the photon came on this route. This is all the reasoning of Wheeler, which I repeat here. So by putting, so we have the particle feature here, and here we have the wave feature. So by putting in the a mirror or not, in the last instant, by your decision, you can decide whether the system behaved as a particle or as a wave. And this is even more mind-boggling. Wheeler suggests, here is a picture of John Archibald Wheeler. Wheeler suggests if you look at the, at the a picture of quasars, you have heard quasars already once here the second time, uh, a picture of quasars. He said uh, there are situations, they are now well known, there are now many, where you have a quasar here, maybe 10 billion or more years away, and uh, you have galaxies in between. And the situation uh, can be but that by chance a galaxy is, or more galaxies are such that they redirect the light uh, in, in a way, they deflect the light here in a way that there are actually two routes how the light can, can come to us. The way we know this is by just looking up and we see two images or even more images of, of the same quasar. How do we know it's the same quasar? Because it has the same spectrum. Now he simply says, well, let's recombine, let's recombine in a, in a beam splitter, let's recombine the light uh, in a, in a, using a beam splitter and then by deciding in the last instance whether we put the beam splitter in or not, uh, we can decide whether the, he, as he says, this is his language, 
whether the photon traveled on one way, the last 10 billion years or on both ways, you know. I don't want to comment his language, but this is the way he argues. Now, there's another, the other experiment, which is the other Gedanken experiment in a similar spirit, a beautiful suggestion by Scully and Drühl in 1982, where, where, where he proposed the, the quantum eraser idea. And uh, again, the situation is very similar to, to, to the delayed choice situation. We have what we have here is an atom interferometer, an atom interferometer, where an atom can pass through two, two slits. This is a little bit more complicated, but here, uh, but here are the two slits actually, and we can see interference patterns somewhere in an observation screen. Or here are the two slits, yeah. Well, uh, these are preparation slits, and they are the final slits where the, where the, where the amplitudes come from. And then uh, uh, Scully and Drill say, okay, I, we ca I can put a cavity here uh, where I can basically uh, uh, collect and detect the, f uh, the photon, these atoms are excited, the photon emitted by the atom. Uh, what can happen is that, the, that the f uh, if, the, if the atom emits the photon while it is in this cavity region, uh, we don't know whether it is it emitted here or it emitted here. But if we put detector, a detector here, in between there's a detector. If I put a, 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 a detector here, uh, then uh, if this detector registers uh, the photon, and if we do it the right way, then this information does not tell us anything whether the uh, atom propagated along this uh, path or on this path. And therefore, the interference fringes should appear. And there's a, there's a whole line of argument uh, which is very similar to, to Bell's argument, but I don't want to go into any, any detail. So basically, uh, the way you look at this uh, emitted photon, whether you look at it in a way which allows you to tell whether both, uh, uh, whether it went here or here, or the, whether you look at it in a way that you erase the past information, uh, uh, defines whether you get interference fringes or not. The kind of experiment which we did, I just want to cut time, sh cut, cut it short a little bit. The time of experiment uh, we did was following a suggestion by Quiert and, and Engliert. There's a beautiful uh, title of the paper. It says, the title is Quantum Erasing the Nature of Reality or Perhaps the Reality of Nature. That's a beautiful pun, I think. So the idea is simply the following. Uh, we kind of, it's a kind of a combination of these two ideas uh, that we have a source which produces entangled photons, polarization entangled photons. We subject one of the two photons through an interferometer uh, uh, where polarization corresponds to the path taken, and we flip one of the polarizations here, not shown here, but that is obvious. And the other photon is subject to a polarization measurement at some distance. Then, uh, because of this uh, polarization entanglement I told you before, the polarization of this photon carries path information about the other photon. But we can erase this path information by measuring the polarization of this photon on the direction 45 degrees to the two original horizontal vertical. And if we do this, then this, fo this distance photon uh, must show interference. And what we actually do in the experiment, we do this space-like separated such that no communication is possible from A to B uh, uh, because communication is limited by the speed of light. So th there have been earlier uh, beautiful experiments including uh, a French group of Grangier, Aspré, and Roche with individual photons, but this is a, a, an experiment where you do this space-like separated such that no information can propagate. And finally, uh, we did the same kind of thing between La Palme and Tenerife again. One of the two photons is measured in the interferometer, and the other one, 144 kilometer away, we measure its polarization, either such that we reveal the past information or that we erase the past information. Now, what remains to be done? There are clearly a lot of things which can be done. One would be a multiparticle quantum eraser, higher order entanglements, that would be quite interesting, three or four particle entanglements, uh, and combine this with the delayed choice uh, situation, or do the same kind of thing 
with all kinds of meta waves having entanglement, having entangled state. There have been experiments with uh, meta waves uh, on the quantum eraser, but as far as I know, uh, uh, not the same kind of situation we are talking about here. Now, I want to ask a few questions. One is that these experiments tell us that local realistic theories are inconsistent, uh, both with the predictions of quantum theory and with experimental observation. So we might ask ourselves now, uh, what is, which assumption is wrong? Is it the assumption of locality, or is it the assumption of realism, or is it both? What's going on? And it was, it was considered to be, these two assumptions were, uh, were, is very, uh, very difficult to separate, but there was, uh, these are the definitions of reality and locality. It's very difficult to separate until Leggett in, 19, in 2005, or 2003, proposed a, what is called crypto non-local hidden variable theory without going into too much details. In this kind of theory, it is allowed that the measurement result on one side not only depends on the measurement parameter on this side, but also on the measurement parameter on the other side, on the orientation of the polarizer on the other side. Now, you would say that this is impossible. It would instantly allow faster than light communication. This is something which, which in physics we don't want. Well, uh, uh, Bell, uh, 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 Leggett was actually able to show that there are theories for which, for which uh, the, since you only can look at ensembles, you cannot conclude uh, what, the, what the measurement setting on the other side is. So we don't, don't, don't violate the no signaling con uh, condition, but these theories are realistic in the sense that they assume that all the, the, the uh, features you measure have been there prior to and independent of experiments. So they are realistic and non-local. Now, these kind of experiments were excluded uh, by us here in Vienna and in uh, Singapore. And uh, so the question is, what, what does that tell us? Uh, does it tell us that uh, it hints, at, it is not a confirmation, but it hints that reality is the culprit. And there's another confirmation of an experiment which we recently did. It's not published yet. It's the uh, PhD thesis work of Radek Lapkiewicz, uh, which is quite on, on individual quantum systems. Just consider the following game. I have, I have a magician. This, is, this, this picture was, was uh, proposed by Radek. I like it. It's very nice. A magician uh, uh, can do the following. There are these five corners. And he can put balls onto the five uh, corners. And you are allowed to lift two cups at a time. Two cups at a time. And the question is, can he arrange it in such a way that if you, if you always lift two cups which are connected by a line only, can he arrange it in such a way that you have, that you have uh, uh, this, uh, that you have the uh, different, uh, so, 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 so that you have, so you open this, you have one here and nothing here. Uh, can you arrange in such a way that what, whatever two uh, cups you lift, there's always, uh, uh, there's always only one ball and not two. Now it is clear if you look at this, this is not possible. Because if this contains a ball, this one must not, this one has one, this one must not, this one has one, and therefore this one must not. So we have a logical contradiction. This can be put into, into equations. I don't want to bore you with that. There's an, if you calculate the expectation value of a product of, of the four observer, four, uh, 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 five observables, in a, the, the, we say that the magician wins if they are, if they are uh, a mod, if this expectation value is less than minus three, if you assign plus one, minus one to this, but it's the same story. And quantum mechanics, low, uh, it, right? In quantum mechanics, lo and behold, tell us, tells us uh, if you have, if you choose certain states. This was suggested by Kliashko et al. If you choose certain states, this is now a picture of the three-dimensional Hilbert space, and you have various directions. You have five directions along which you measure, uh, measure uh, your, uh, your quantum system. 
Uh, these directions, basic, uh, by the way, are pairwise orthogonal, which is important because the squared print, uh, spin projections along these, these directions commute. Therefore, it would not be in, the, uh, in contradiction with quantum mechanics you assume to assume that they have well-defined values independent of observation. And it turns out that the sum of these five, uh, five products according to quantum mechanics is, is, uh, is uh, smaller than minus three in violation of the classical picture. So it says that if you had quantum cups, it can actually be that sometimes you fulfill this condition five times, which is completely impossible in a, in a classical situation. Now, in the experiment, I don't want to go into details. In the experiment, we realized the situation by having uh, individual photons, from a, uh, single photons from a pair, uh, in, in, in three state systems, where two states are two polarizations of one mode, and the third one is a third propagation mode. And we can play around in this Hilbert space by just uh, uh, turning around the polarization and interchanging the modes uh, of these beams. Here are the people uh, uh, who did the experiment. Uh, quantum mechanics confirms, uh, experiment confirms the quantum prediction. So this is now a test of quantum reality independent of entanglement. It can be seen as a verification of the famous Koch and Specker theorem, something we also talked about in the seminar. Here's the famous waterfall by Escher. It's a little bit like the waterfall. You have uh, water fr uh, flowing down here. Each of these links is reasonable. We have one, two, three, four, and five links, just as we have it in the experiment. Each of, uh, if each of them is reasonable, but altogether they make no sense. This is very much the situation we, we have here. By the way, this idea goes back. Uh, you can view it in different ways. One can view it on the one hand as as confirming the non-existence of these properties before you do experiment, but you also can view it as confirming uh, that there is no joint positive value probability distributions uh, distribution for all these observables. Now, this was first proposed by Specker and then by Kochen Specker. Uh, uh, Specker is a very interesting uh, person. He's still alive in, in, in Zurich. The, uh, he was at the ETH. And his, his motivation, I learned this from, from, uh, from uh, uh, my, our friend here, uh, uh, Swotzil, uh, and, uh, and he himself, and, and Specker confirmed it, was that he wanted to know uh, the following situation. Suppose uh, on the day of the last judgment, we, are, we, we have to appear in front of God, and God has to decide whether we did good or whether, we, or whether our deeds were bad. In order to find out whether what we did was okay, uh, Specker argues it would be God. It would be good if God would know what would have happened if we had made a different decision in certain situation. This, this, he, uh, the, uh, and the question is: Can God always uh, find out? Uh, can God always think about what would have been the result of a different decision? And it turns out that this kind of experiment tells us that it's not always possible. Not even God knows what the alternative would, would have been if we would have decided in a different way. By the way, Keck, Specker is, uh, preaches, preaches regularly in churches and so on. He's a very interesting person. Uh, Specker called this infuturabilia. I always say this because the motivations to do science can be very different ones. So, so what remains to be done? What remains to be done is to find new combinations, testing other combinations of the fundamental ideas. Why is this interesting? Well, one of the questions which fascinates me, and I will be coming to an end very soon, is the question, why do we not have a test theory of quantum mechanics? A little bit like, and my relativity friends here apologize, like the, like the, uh, uh, the parameters in the parametric post-Newtonian formalism in in relativity theory, or even more parameters, if when one goes beyond the weak, weak field case, where you have a general framework of theories, you have certain parameters uh, uh, where uh, special, where general relativity is a, is a specific uh, uh, situation. If you try the same in quantum mechanics, all kinds of strange things break loose. Non-locality, 
not non-conservation of, of, of probability and, and so on and so on. So this, in my eyes, is a very deep message which we probably haven't understand yet. So the question is, what, what in my eyes, what remains to be done is either to finally construct the test theory of quantum mechanics or understand why this is fundamentally impossible. Either of the two would be very interesting and we would learn something. Now, uh, I don't want to go into this kind of thing, so it would be interesting uh, to, in the, in the, in the, I just want, since it connects to the experiments here in the house, I want to raise another question concerning uh, quantum interference. As you all know, there have been uh, uh, many experiments, and they are now done by Markus Arndt in his, his group. He tries to go to larger and larger and larger objects. Uh, the big question is, how far can we go? Is there any limit? Uh, and in my eyes, here are some experiments going on in the Aspelmeyer group, but this is just an example of an exploding field right, right now, showing quantum phenomena of uh, mechanical systems. What remains to be done in my, my eyes is to show that there is no limit. To show, to convince everybody, even even uh, people who don't believe it, that there is no limit, because then we finally would force everybody to take quantum mechanics more serious than they do now. If quantum physics would be an everyday phenomenon, that would be quite interesting. Now, I want to con conclude with a few pictures which I got from Renate. You have to guess who this is. <laughs> this is John Bell, by the way. This is a few years ago, not so long, I suppose, right? Not so long ago. And uh, as I said, uh, here is some more quantum people. Now you see the socks in full glory. <laughs> but I understand that, uh, that uh, uh, Reinhold has a little bit of an exhibitionist character. You can, he actually likes it when you ask him to show his socks. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can ask him to show his socks. Here they are. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, Alain Aspe. You know who did this famous experiments on quantum entanglement. Here is Roger Penrose, who, among other things, proposed some uh, limit, the existence of some limit of of uh, quantum mechanics for large objects. Then uh, here is. Uh, uh, Reinhold as a teacher, I, I understand that from feedback from students that his lectures on quantum mechanics are very well received and students really like, like the way he, he presents it and I cherish really uh, our uh, memories for, from at least, I, I think it must be 25 years now at least, if not more. This happens to be on one of the favorite locations at least of myself in the world. Uh, here back here is the Traunstein, and here is the Traunsee uh, uh, in the area where we do uh, uh, some of our experiments. And I want to conclude with my very best wishes, not only for your birthday, but for, for, the, for many years to come. Thank you very much.